Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. You listen to the coaches panel. Dane Zorko here from the Brisbane Lions. Jason Johannesson from the Western Bulldogs. Luke Parker here from the Sydney Swans. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows, and you're listening to the coaches panel. Max Hall and Melbourne Football Club. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club, and you're listening to the coaches panel. Hello, friends. It's MJ from the coaches panel. Number 35 in our 50 most relevant is a player that moved clubs during the most recent trade period. The former Brisbane Lion, now he's a West Coast Eagle. I'm talking about Alex Witherden. For some, he's too high on this list. He shouldn't have even been on the 50 most relevant. For others, they're like, MJ, mate, what are you doing? He's a lock of a top 20 this year. You're crazy. Well, we are going to talk about all those things and more on this episode. Joining me for his first episode of the 2021 season, I've got Benny Gogos. Hello, buddy. How are you? Hey, mate. Very excited to be here. It's, uh, it's an interesting pod today, so um, thanks, for, thanks for having me. I thought I'd send you a curly one for your first episode of the 2021 Fantasy Footy season, mate. So, look, the 22-year-old Alex Witherden, he has been moving from the Sunshine State all the way uh, to the West Coast Eagles. He is a defender, and there's some pretty decent scores when you look through what he did, not just in 2020, but what he's been able to do over his very short career so far, his highest score last year in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team was a 93 against the Essendon Football Club. That's not an adjusted score. It's what he did. It's a little bit closer to the 115-120 marker if you do want to play the AFL Fantasy adjusted scores. While in Supercoach, this is a nice monster for you. 170 in the same game. Not bad. That's a career-high score from him. While in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, his career-high score came a couple of years earlier against the Crows. In 2018, he scored a 138. In AFL Fantasy, he is going to be priced at the adjusted average of 97.25. That's the multiplication of times 1.25 of what he actually returned, which is what he'll be delivering for us in Dream Team, which is a 77.8. While in Supercoach, he's one of the more expensive defenders in the format as well, 94.3. In that format, he's going to set you back just under $450,000. While in AFL Fantasy, he's just over six hundred and fifty k, And in Dream Team, he's just under $650,000. Ben, it was only a couple of years ago, um, in, in late in the half of 2017 season, that a cash cow, Alex Witherden, burst onto the fantasy footy scene and from pretty much from that point on in 2017, right up until the end of the 2019 season, Alex Witherden was almost dubbed a premium from day one. That's how good he was scoring. Yeah, he, he debuted in round 14, 2017 against the Giants, scoring a, a 77 and 76 in uh, Dream Team and Supercoach respectively. And he didn't miss a beat from that moment going forward. So first season, he averages 88, 87, and he's an absolute essential superstar. I recall very distinctly in that season, MJ, that everyone owned him. Mm. He became basically an Uber pick because for a 100K rookie style, you could get uh, a premium type score. Who doesn't love that? Everyone. 2018, he basically backs it up. 2019 is a more difficult season for him, which is maybe maybe where I think my train of thought initially leads when I think of Alex Witherden these days. And then 2020, he, uh, in limited game time, he produces outstanding numbers. So, look, uh, the thing with Alex is he's never been shy of finding the footy. He's, uh, he's always been a ball magnet. He's always been someone that, that is a reliable uh, generator of, I guess, uh, rebound 50s for the club. The question that, that has been sort of more brought to the table, I guess, over the past two seasons has been his, his use, yeah. especially his use, his use through the corridor where he's, he's had many, many very dangerous kicks. If they haven't uh, directly hurt Brisbane, they've, they've often hurt them like a, eventually in the next two to three possessions. So he's someone that, that I would treat with caution. If you could guarantee to me Alex Witherden would be playing 22 games in the 2021 AFL season, Especially down at down in uh, WA, where where they've got the the wider boundaries, there's a lot more kick mark, obviously, with the way that the way that the, his new club, the West Coast Eagles, play. Um, I would be very very excited about this pick. However, as as I'm sure we'll get onto in a second, I have a little bit of concern at this price point that we're possibly buying him at a at a very high price with. Uh, it, Respected to the fact that he's a, he's a fantastic player, but 
uh, with a little bit less certainty over whether his production is going to at least maintain and preferably increase. So for those reasons, I would, I would probably be against starting with Alex Witherden, but I can I can see certain people making a case for that. Yeah, well, you, you want to look at why, you know, his 2020 unfolded the way he did. You touched on that really strong point of him making some costly turnover decisions and over the past few years Brisbane have really grown and matured in terms of that ball use certainly um, the health of and the recruitment of Grant Birchall just 12 months earlier probably didn't help him as well as Daniel Rich really starting to find his own in that quarterbacking role really since Luke Hodge moved on as well but those scores you're right he, he's priced at a guy that it can be and should be considered in premium territory. Three tons in Supercoach last year, including that huge 170 against the Bombers. That's right up there with arguably the best ceiling of any defender that we can have. Now, the fact that he hasn't gone that big ever before probably would indicate maybe it's more of an outlier than the norm, but he's done it before, so we can say that is his ceiling. Similarly, in Dream Team and AFL Fantasy, um, three scores, 89 or above. Again, 80s was the hundreds of, for the 2020 season. So that's right in the wheelhouse. And those 2017, 2018, 2019 numbers, he's delivering very much in this consistent patch. In, in fact, over his final 10 games in 2018, he averaged 99 in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, 93 in Supercoach, in and around the price point of what he's got. And now he does head to this West Coast Eagles team that are notoriously known for their strong tolls intercepting the ball, laying it off to that a variety of different small defenders, maintaining possession through marks and through kicks. It's where Andrew Gaff becomes an elite premium midfielder for us across all of the formats. But you bring up this interesting point, Ben, of is he even best 22? Because when I look at that West Coast defensive kind of core six to eight, it doesn't feel that there's an obvious position for him to slide in. These, these are the guys that I'm going to say are inside their their core defensive unit. Barras, Shepard, Cole, Duggan, Hearn, McGovern. And you could probably argue Rotham and Nelson have done enough to be considered in that part as well. They've spent enough time through that back line. How do you see, where does he fit into the side? Is it, we need an injury to a Shepherd or a Hearn or a, does a Duggan get dropped because of him? Like, what's his way into this West Coast Eagles back six? Because if he can get in there, the game style's perfect for him. But if not, there's no guarantee he plays more games this year than he did last year. Absolutely. I, I think that his, his most likely route into the defence is actually either a fantastic run in form at the beginning of the season or perhaps more likely an injury to one of those names you've mentioned. Mm. Uh, I, think, I think Duggan is the one that he's, he's most likely to be battling it out with, so to speak. Yep. Um, Duggan, for me, offers a little bit more from a defensive perspective, especially with, with the smaller forward. And that's something that, that Witherden, I think, has been sort of bringing into his game, but it, it hasn't been a strong point of his. Um, so I, I would have a little bit of concern there whether he wins that, that 1v1. Yeah. Um, it's worth, worth mentioning as well what the Eagles paid to get him into the footy club. Yeah. So um, the Eagles actually brought him in for pick 58, which was the, the trade they uh, secured that deal that pick off the Tom Hickey deal. Yeah. So they basically viewed him as, as being roughly roughly the same price as uh, Tom Hickey. Now, that's probably not in that's not a great indicator for his likelihood of playing in the in the best twenty two from day one. Mm. Um, now if if they maybe threw a first round pick at him, Different my view on this would change. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but given that pick fifty eight, I think you, you know, we're looking at a player here that has been outstanding from day one, as we've alluded to, but still a very, very young player. Mm. And he, he has a long, long career at the at the West Coast Eagles. And it would not surprise me one bit if West Coast spent the first sort of 12 years, uh, the, the first 12 months, um, developing him into a, a stronger, more robust uh, general defender, uh, someone who's more capable of dealing with the with the smaller forwards, the, the elite small, uh, small forwards in the competition. And then they slowly introduce him um, whilst, you know, some of those defenders in the West Coast back line age out of the side. I think that that, that almost makes a, a heap of sense for the footy club. 
Now, in the short term, I think he's battling it out. So my personal view would be that he does not start in the round one side, or if he does start, the pressure on his position is immediate from day one. Yeah. Unless, of course, we see injuries to the back line um, very early on. And, of course, we haven't even played a, a game of pre-season footy. We know that injuries will occur during that period. So so keep an eye, keep an eye on that and keep an eye on what's happening with the West Coast list. But... I would be very uh, concerned spending the, the prices that we're, we're talking about here, elite, elite territory prices, on a guy that I, I question whether he's in that top arm, the top 22. And that's probably the big point, isn't it? Is when you're spending this amount of dollars on a player, you need to get that return immediately. He's priced inside Supercoach. He's priced inside the top 20 defenders right now in terms of what his price point is at. Very, very similar for us uh, in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team as well, where he's that guy that at this price point, you can't really afford for him to miss for you. You need him to be best 22. And as you've said, what do we need? Like he's ranked the fifth highest defender in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. It is cheaper in Dream Team almost to get... Um, now, this is by average rather than by price point. Um, you still very much need him to deliver for you in incredible ways. And I, I don't know if there's enough for me. I know different members of the coaches panel feel differently. But for me, I don't know, even if he owns the preseason and owns the distribution role off halfback, if for me, now for others it might be different, but for me, if that gives me the confidence at this price point to go, yeah, I'm going to start him. Like, I don't know if what I need to see will be enough to make me change my perspective on whether to start him or not. So someone that is going to want to start him, you've got to be really bullish that he owns that role. You've got to really be bullish that he's safe inside that best 22. And that, yeah, injuries can come, and that's a part of the game. But getting dropped is not something you're expecting for a guy that you're paying this level of output on at the start. That's what you've got to be absolutely convinced of in your mind, that he's best 22, that he's going to have that key distribution role. He's not going to be playing lockdown um, and and that he's not going to get moved on from the side for a Duggan to take that place or for another of their developing youngs to to take that place. So that's got to be where you're convinced because from a defensive premium line, it's actually quite a nice little week for us. You, you could argue Jordan Ridley in Supercoach. He's got some value in Dream Team and Fantasy. He's probably one of the big names through there. And then the other is a Zach Williams from Carlton. They're probably the, the biggest name premiums from a fantasy perspective. He's battling it out in his buy round, which is round 13. So I, I'd actually be, feel quite comfortable to target him as an in-season trade because at least I want to see a, a bunch of weeks factual in season of what he can deliver before I go there. I wouldn't talk anybody out of starting him, but I would certainly highlight that there are some substantial risks with doing it. What are you doing with him, Benny? Yeah, I have a similar train of thought. I'll I'll try and bring up some contrarian um, ideas though to to add a little bit of balance to the the pod, but I guess I guess what one of the benefits to him is that if he is enabled that role as yeah. the key distributor, he's playing in one of the best defences for large fantasy scores across the competition. Um, he's playing. He's playing as a as a, a man that's just entering his fifth season of AFL football. Yeah. So you would imagine that natural development is on the horizon for him, um, and he's also got a ceiling like no other, as we've seen yeah. with that 170 super coach. So. Look, the the possibility of him starting the season on fire and getting away from you is certainly there. Yeah. I, don't, I I don't think that that's really that that can really be disputed as much. But I could certainly make the same case for any of the names we've mentioned in that premium bracket as well. Um, outside of maybe a Rory Led who who hasn't quite um delivered the, those huge scores in in sort of the last season or so. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that's that sort of. I think the the strong conviction benefits to an Alex Witherden. I have uh, many concerns around his job um, prospects, as as you and I have outlined. So I would feel much more comfortable with a wait and see, Mm. or if not, an an injury, a long-term injury to one of the key distributors in the the defence. If that happened, then I think we we basically this uh, this podcast would almost be 
irrelevant. We'd have to do a new one um, and, <laughs> and, you know, completely, completely change our, our train of thought because that, that would completely change the dynamics of this position. But for now, given the, the information that we have, I would I would be strongly uh, advocating for a wait and see approach. Yeah, look, if the planets align for him, he's going to be that consistent mid-90s performer for us for a really long period of time. He showed glimpses of it at Brisbane. He went on runs for it at Brisbane. And like you said, he's at the perfect team West Coast for the team defence, for the game style to enable his best fantasy game to come to pass. And so I see a world where that can happen. But I'm also seeing a world where he's battling it out week in, week out to stay in that side. Which story you choose to believe right now heading through the preseason will ultimately determine whether or not he is a start or a pass, or an upgrade target for you in 2021. But where he goes in drafts, Ben, really fascinates me. He's ranked inside the top 20 for averages uh, across all formats of the game. But I don't feel like on draft day, I could pick him at that D2 territory. I feel like, given all the potential risks, even though it's bullish person uh, on Alex with it, and I don't think we'd be really comfortable with him sitting at D2, I think where I'm ranking him, I'm probably going to miss him because I'd feel most comfortable picking him as a late D3, early D4. Like that's that's the early teens territory of a draft. I know he's not going to fall to me in a draft at that point, but I just, I'm, I'm not wanting to pick a D3 that I'm not certain is in the best 22. Again, like you said, barring injury. Where do you think you should be picking him in a draft? It feels like he's a really tough guy to place. Or opinion to yours, MJ. Uh, I would not feel very comfortable taking him in the first 12 or so rounds. Um, I think that a player like Alex, given what he produced uh, um, across the season, he traditionally will get picked up a little bit earlier than that because a lot of uh, a lot of people that maybe are, are a little bit less researched will see the average and will get very excited by that. Yeah. Um, as you know, potentially they should be, but. Yeah. I have a few more a few more concerns, and so I would be considering him as if he was to be a D three. It's because I've filled out my midfield ruck and, and uh, forward line very strongly. Okay, um, and I I would almost be thinking, yeah, he he's not someone that I'd be looking at in the first uh, twelve or so rounds because I I just believe in that that core group, that core dozen or so um, initial group. You need to have everyone certainly playing. Um, I I personally look for highly durable players as well, mm. um, because that that is one of the issues with uh, with the fantasy draft, especially a season long fantasy draft, is that uh, the variance on injuries can be the indicator of your success, basically. So uh, for that reason, I I would be looking elsewhere. But um, having said all that, if you are more bullish than than you and I, um, MJ, then I think you know he's someone who potentially could move up to a D2 for you if you're feeling that strong, yeah. strongly inclined. Well, that's it. Um, he's got that potential, doesn't he? He's He's got the potential to be the mid to high 90s average, which is what he's priced at for us right now across the formats. And if he delivers that and you're pick, getting him at a late D2 or even an early D3, let's be honest, that's probably your number one defender for the year. And so that's the sort of value of return you do need. There's, there's risk associated, sure, but... He, he's got the upside for you that if the story comes to pass, he's going to be one of the picks of the year if it works out for you in drafts. Oh, yeah. He, he's going to be one of these guys that are... The the person that picks Alex Witherden, you're going to be watching closely <laughs> to see whether they whether it's a six, uh, success or whether it's a failure. Because if it... If it works out for you, then oh, that boy. honestly could be one of the one of the picks of the draft. Yeah. Um, because I, I think most people are a little bit wary. They do see the six games played in 2020, and that is that is often often viewed as quite a negative. So he he could be a huge huge la- um, launching pattern. It's going to be absolutely fascinating to to watch. I think I'll personally be watching a little bit from afar hmm. um, at the beginning, MJ. But it's going to be fantastic to watch it, and I. I can't wait to see him uh, wear the West Coast colours as well. Yeah, no, looking forward to it. Hey, mate, appreciate your thoughts today on Alex Witherden.
No, thank you, Matt. If you want to go and check out the article on him, it is online now for you at coachespanel.tv. All the other players revealed in the 50 most relevant so far. Well, you can go back and check them out as well. He's a fascinating player, Alex Witherden. And 24 hours ago, our Patreons already knew about this episode. They'd already listened to it. It's one of the great perks our premium and breakout tier supporters do get. If you want to support what the Coaches Panel do, there's a bunch of different supporter level tiers you can get involved. The links for that are at coachespanel.tv. And you can go back and check out all the other podcasts that we've done so far and those that are to come by following, by subscribing to us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or via Apple iTunes. Everywhere, pretty much, you get a podcast, you can probably find these coaches panel episodes tomorrow we move away from the mid 30s into the early 30s that's what if you're age 34 keep telling yourself that's what 34 is early 30s yeah whatever you reckon